COVID-19 outbreak was declared as public health emergency of international concern uh, uh, by WHO on 30th of January 2020. Uh, and then it was declared as a pandemic on 11th of March 2020. And since COVID-19 uh, affects all facets of society, health, security, political, economic, and social, uh, the WHO Director General requested all countries to adopt a whole of government and a whole of society approach built around a comprehensive strategy to prevent infections, save lives, and minimize uh, impact. Really, COVID-19 has really impacted the health system. The health system is already fragile, so it really has stressed the health system and has uh, affected also the um, delivery of uh, essential health uh, services. Now, if we see the global current situation, uh, to date, to WHO, as at yesterday, the 1st of July, there have been more than 181 million cases of COVID-19 cases, with close to 4 million deaths. And then, if you see the six WHO regions of the world, Americas, Europe, Southeast Asia, Eastern Mediterranean, Africa, and Western Pacific, the Americas happen to be the most uh, or the worst hit ones. Uh, Americas, when you say America, is both South and North America, with uh, uh, almost 72 million uh, cases. And the least affected is uh, the Western Pacific region, uh, with uh, about 3.5 uh, million uh, cases. Africa, you could see, is the last, uh, the last, to the, se the second to the last, with about 4 million uh, cases. And the low number in Af Africa is attributed to many factors. It's not yet very clear. But the fact that testing is not as wide as other, uh, other countries, uh, and also the fact that African population, the young population, and COVID affects the elderly ones also contributes to the low number of cases in the African region. So this is what I've been uh, saying. Uh, Americas are the worst affected, and the least affected is the Western Pacific region. Africa having about 4 million deaths and about uh, 95 uh, million uh, uh, I mean, uh, 4 million cases and about 95 million uh, deaths. And if you see the epidemic curve, especially of the, uh, uh, of the African region, uh, to date, as I said, there are, there are uh, 4.8, uh, 4, 4 million uh, deaths uh, recorded by WHO. And you could see that there have been uh, three, uh, so far, three waves of the epidemic. The first wave was like between May, uh, June, uh, July, August, uh, coming in September, October, coming down. Then there was a second wave uh, towards end of December, January, February. Uh, again, it came down around March. And now it looks like a third wave has started, uh, which started uh, end of May, uh, June. And you can see that the second wave is much higher, the peak is much higher than the first wave. And the third wave is much higher than the second wave. In terms of severity, in terms of transmissibility, uh, it looks like already now it has not reached its peak, but it looks like by 5th of July or so, it will be uh, as high as uh, the second wave. But still, it has not yet reached its peak. So we are expecting that a lot more countries would be hit by this uh, uh, second wave. I mean, third wave. So, uh, currently, if you see again Africa, uh, uh, you know, those countries neighboring Tanzania, like DRC, uh, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, all those are in third wave. And especially in Uganda, about 99% of all cases is because of this new variant, which we call the Delta variant. So, as I said, it is very much transmissible and uh, it's severe 
uh, and uh, the the number of hospitalization is also uh, lengthy as compared to the uh, other to the alpha uh, in the beta uh, variants but countries are not do not have the same picture for example if you see kenya already they are through their third wave uh, you can see that it has come down this is the upper graph the red one and uganda uh, you see that it's still on the third wave but you can see how how high uh, the the peak uh, of the third wave is uh, it looks like it hasn't even uh, reached uh, the peak we don't know but we, we we are following it up so also we have been able to assess the risk uh, in the african region we have done risk assessment and we have identified uh, uh, several uh, 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 variants which are of concern and this delta variant is one which is really very uh, worrisome uh, and then countries have also continued uh, to report challenges especially with the capacity and how they could maintain uh, uh, sufficient resources for continuity of essential health services uh, there there is unequal unequitable availability of vaccines uh, so far about 4 billion vaccines have been administered uh, globally but only one percent has been administered in sub-saharan africa so you see that there are two tracks of the pandemic one track is countries uh, who have high coverage of vaccine so as a result there is a decreasing number of cases and deaths and there are other track uh, I mean group of countries like uh, in, in, in africa and asia where there are no vaccines no public health measures and there is a big surge of cases and also the dates are also uh, increasing so there are this differential in WHO is really trying to make sure that vaccines are equitably distributed across the globe uh, also there is only one treatment as you know COVID does not have a such treatment uh, and there's only one that is systemic corticosteroid that have been shown to reduce mortality in patients with severe COVID-19 so this again is another uh, challenge and also uh, with the mentioned factors the risk associated with further spread of the SARS-CoV-2 in the Africa region is currently assessed as high to very high uh, for the overall population and very high for vulnerable uh, individuals so the risk is really generally very high I would say for the African region so in terms of response, uh, there are four scenarios that WHO has described. Scenario one is where there are no uh, uh, reported cases. Scenario two is where there are sporadic cases, but these cases are not related. Yeah? They are really spod sporadic, they, are, they have their own sources. Then there are scenarios where there are clusters of cases. Each cluster, you can really trace where so and so got the disease and so on and so forth. So you can have different clusters. And the fourth one is community transmission. In many countries, in most of the countries, uh, the transmission is a community transmission. So depending on which scenario a country is, you can uh, adopt different uh, strategies uh, to control it. For example, for scenarios one, two, three, it's mainly to stop transmission and prevent spread. And for scenario three and four, it's mainly to slow transmission reduce case and also reduce mortality in community outbreaks so based on the scenarios and on this uh, there are different strategies uh, the major one is to that WHO strategy is to improve countries uh, to have to maintain country readiness and response intervention and every country has to be ready we have tools to support countries in this area uh, also there are interventions to reduce exposure like communicating with or engaging and empowering communities to adopt risk reducing behaviors uh, there are strategies to suppress uh, transmission like detecting cases uh, testing them quarantining them if case, uh, if case are positive isolating them so these are just to suppress transmission and other things are to reduce more five minutes left and morbidity uh, meaning that uh, improving the care uh, of, 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 of 
patients suffering from COVID. So the major thing, I don't know if you see this, uh, this slide clearly, we know what to do. There are personal protection measures, there are uh, uh, travel related measures, there are social distancing measures, and there are um, avoid, avoiding crowding measures. You know, there are different measures, but there is no one simple uh, magic bullet here. You know, we have to use what they call the Swiss cheese approach. Like if you line Swiss cheese, the holes are not in the same place. If it passes one, then at least if the next cheese or slice of cheese, if, if, there is, if, it, if there's a block, then it will not be able to pass that one. So all these measures have to be implemented together so that uh, we have effective uh, prevention. So there is no simple measure, even vaccines. These are not magic bullets. So it has to be done with, 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 with other uh, preventive measures. Uh, then uh, accelerating equitable access to new COVID-19 tools to guidelines and so on is another uh, diagnostics and therapeutics is, a, is another strategy. Protecting the most vulnerable, especially those with comorbidity, those who are elderly is another strategy. Strengthening the existing regional coordination mechanism, supporting integration uh, of COVID response within the health system, not having a fragmented approach, uh, and also conducting robust and continuous monitoring evaluation research are uh, the strategies that WHO is adopting. And we also have proposed that countries have about 11 pillars. We have uh, 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 risk communication and community engagement pillar. We have vaccine pillar. We have case management pillar. So all these pillars also have to work together in order to have this readiness uh, and uh, response uh, measure. Uh, so actually, there are challenges uh, uh, and also lessons learned. Uh, these are some of the challenges. Just, just to mention a few, lack of political will is one. Uh, some countries don't follow the WHO's recommendation or they are lax. There is no imposition of some of the public health measures. Uh, there is constraint availability of local health products and supplies. Uh, reluctance of some uh, couriers to, uh, to, 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 to carry uh, lab materials from one place to another, to another, another one. Uh, uh, procurement of supply because of the global shortage and also because of the borders closing and so on is another challenge. Uh, then the weak health system, as I said, has been a very big challenge in the African region. Uh, inadequate data sharing. Some countries are not sharing data, so we don't even know where we are in the, in the epidemic. What, what is the trajectory? Where are we going? It's difficult to mobilize funds, and it's difficult to know what the risk is in those countries. And illegal border closing also uh, poses a big, a big, a big uh, problem. However, not everything is good. There are some opportunities. Because as a result of this epidemic, there have been some improvements in national test testing capabilities. Before this, this uh, COVID-19 came, there were only few uh, laboratories that could identify COVID-19. But now there are so many in the African region. Even at country level, there has been some strength in laboratory capacity. Uh, vaccines and therapeutics. There are so many vaccines on the pipeline who would really help uh, in, in, in this area of uh, uh, vaccinating uh, people. So that's another class. Uh, and then, especially in Africa, the fact that the emergency or the, 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 uh, the COVID pandemic is slow has given us some time to buy and also to study about the trajectory of this, the disease and how we can really respond uh, when this epidemic uh, comes. And especially in health system strengthening, uh, say, for example, oxygen in Africa and totally generally in Africa, there were only 60 oxygen plants when the epidemic began. Now we have got over 100. So there are things really we have gained uh, as a result uh, of the epidemic and not everything uh, is good. But still, we have a long way to go and uh, we need to really help countries uh, to support uh, in the readiness as well as in the response 
uh, epidemic. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman.